Welcome back. So this lecture builds upon our previous lecture about the Lotka Volterra model and the lessons we went through trying to understand uh, the stability and equilibrium of that model. And we now move from the Lotka Volterra model, which describes the population dynamics of a single species to considering the interaction among species in a class of models uh, generated uh, close to a century ago by Lotka and Volterra. So there's a lot of models that fall into this class uh, that describe the interactions between predators and prey, uh, the competition between uh, uh, individuals that are of, of different species instead of the same, and the uh, relationships among different trophic levels. Uh, here I'm going to focus specifically on uh, competitive interactions, though a lot of what we cover here in competitive interactions uh, generalizes quite a, quite well to thinking about uh, the interactions uh, across trophic levels. So as a reminder, um, we were previously talking about logistic growth, it modeled the growth rate, dn, dt, as a function of the intrinsic population growth rate, little r, and the carrying capacity, k. Um, and when r is positive, uh, this has an unstable equilibrium at zero and a stable equilibrium at k, so it will rise from a low population level and reach a carrying capacity. Um, and the, the logistic itself was an extension of the exponential. So remember what we started with was a, an assumption that per capita growth rate, uh, dn dt was uh, constant r, uh, and we replaced that with a uh, per capita growth rate dn dt over n uh, was related to, was a, a, a straight line function. Uh, so we could, if, if we move this n to the denominator, we'd then have dn dt over n, and we'd have something on this side that could be recoded uh, just as a, as a linear model. In fact, it would expand out to r times n minus r over k, or r over k would be the intercept. Uh, Cool. The other thing we also talked about in the last set of lectures was uh, the idea, um, actually, I'm going to take the back back, R over K was the slope, R is the intercept. Uh, we talked about how we solve the equilibrium um, and how we figure out if that equilibrium was stable. We went over it mathematically. Uh, we also went over it graphically. And, and what we want to do in this lecture when we think about species interactions, is I'll, I'll note that all the same things we learned about analyzing equilibrium analytically still apply. But I'm going to focus much more on on how we reach an understanding of the equilibrium um, and, uh, graphically. So we're going to focus mostly on graphical analysis. So as a reminder, here we're looking at this in terms of growth rate dnDt, and so anytime the growth rate is positive. Uh, the species will be increasing. Uh, so positive growth rate, increasing populations up to this carrying capacity. If we're above the carrying capacity, the growth rate would be negative. So that makes means that this equilibrium at this intercept zero there is stable. And the equilibrium here where growth is zero is unstable. So let's think about we extend this, uh, initially just extend this to two species. So if we want to extend this to two species, the simplest thing we could do is write down uh, two, logical, two logistic growth models, where we now have species one, dn dt1, dn1 dt, with a, it, species one has a growth rate r1 and a carrying capacity k1, and species two, n2, has its own growth rate r and its own carrying capacity uh, r2 and k2. Now, the problem with this way of modeling things is that species one and in no way interacts with species two, because you look at the equation for species one and there's no species two in it. And the equation for species two does not have species one in it. And so these two species are comp modeled as completely independent of each other. So it doesn't really represent any sort of relationship, competitive or uh, trophic or um, predatory or any of other sorts of relationships. So we want to think about how do we extend this model? What's the simplest thing we could do to extend this model uh, to incorporate interspecific competition? And the 
tendon, the pattern we're seeing here is we're starting with the simplest possible model and we're doing the simplest possible thing to extend it. Uh, this doesn't necessarily guarantee realism, but it gives us a starting place to write down models and understand concepts. And we can often see that some of the concepts we understand are ultimately be, going to be general and not necessarily highly dependent upon the functional forms. Uh, but even if they are, we can see that uh, jumping off place. So the way we're going to inter incorporate interspecific competition is through what are called competition coefficients. And so we're going to call um, uh, call alpha one two and alpha two one the competition coefficients re respect reflecting uh, the effect of species two on species one and the effect of species one on species two. And we're going to extend uh, a lot of the logistic growth model to become the logical Volterra model uh, in this way. So if you look at these equations, everything up here is identical to up here, except there's now this minus, minus alpha one, two, n two. And similarly, everything down here for dn two is equivalent to the dn two up here, except now I have an alpha two one, n one. And so what these terms are doing is they're subtracting off uh, individuals and you kind of what you can kind of think of these doing is they're translating the numbers of the other species into equivalent numbers intraspecifically. So imagine if alpha is one, that means you would be counting species one and species two equivalently. And the presence of species two essentially lowers the carrying capacity for species one. And the presence of species one essentially lowers the carrying capacity for species two, because it kind of you're envisioning here is that, um, you know, one way you could be envisioning this is, is that the, these species are competing for the same resources and the presence of one species lowers the um, amount of resources available for the other. Now, it should be noted that alpha one, two and alpha two, one don't have to be one. They could be number other numbers representing that different species may have different efficiencies. Uh, and they also don't need to be symmetric. So if alpha two, one is bigger than one, it means that you're uh, impacted more by the other species than by equal numbers of your own species. And, uh, and if it's less than one, it means you're impacted less uh, by individuals of the other species compared to individuals of your own species. Um, and in fact, that that's kind of not uncommon to have those sort of asymmetric competitive interactions. Okay, so the thing that happens with this model is you could, you could plug in uh, initial conditions for both species and simulate it forward. And you could do that numerically by just setting up a loop and that loop would have two equations predicting uh, species one forward as a function of itself and species two and predicting species two forward as a function of species one. So here's an example where I started species two at its carrying capacity around 10. Uh, I then introduced species one. Uh, species one uh, proceeded to grow. Uh, species two, oops, proceeded to decline. And so the adding species one caused uh, species two to go extinct. Um, so that's an example of a competitive interaction where species one was the more, was the dominant species over species two, even though species two was perfectly capable of existing in the system uh, prior to the introduction of species one. So that's one possible outcome of these competitive interactions. I wanted to think now through what are the other possible outcomes? So I'll give you a second to think about that. What are the possible outcomes of two species interacting? So one possible outcome is that the species coexist. And clearly uh, the fact that we have millions of species in the world means that that outcome is not uncommon. Um, it's also possible like we saw in the last simulation that species one persists and species two goes extinct or vice versa. Maybe species two persists and species one goes extinct. Uh, we know that those things happen in, in 
the world as well, that there are competitive interactions where one species can exclude another. And we see it um, in real world management problems with invasive species where a species can persist until the other one arrives and then it's driven extinction. It's also possible for both species to go extinct. So it could be that neither of them have a stable equilibrium. Um, so how do we figure out uh, which outcome is possible? So really, if there's diff these different qualitatively different outcomes, what we need to do to understand which one we're going to end up with is to understand where the equilibrium are. Um, so there's going to be equilibrium where neither species exists, an equilibrium where one species goes to its carrying capacity and the other goes extinct, and vice versa. And then there's going to be this other, I would say the most interesting possibility is when the two species are capable of coexisting. And what are the criteria that allows two species to coexist? I'm going to, uh, in going through this, I'm going to ignore the first option where they both go extinct because it's kind of a trivial case. It occurs when uh, both of their growth rates are negative and it's not particularly interesting. Um, should be note that in these other cases, you can have a species go extinct even when it has a positive growth rate. So I'm going to assume that we're not seeing extinction from these other first two cases uh, because of a negative growth rate. Okay. So how are we going to figure out where the equilibrium are? Um, doing this analytically is kind of daunting because you have to solve, uh, you know, you have the, the, these models and they're at equilibrium when their growth rate are, is zero. Uh, but now you have two equations and two unknowns that you're going to have to solve simultaneously. Uh, so it's going to be a bit of tedious algebra, um, but I'm going to argue that we can use graphical analyses to uh, get through this uh, much more clearly and actually get a better general understanding of what's going on. So as a reminder, previously, when we had one species, uh, when the growth rate is positive, it increased to its carrying capacity. And to understand sorry, to understand where the equilibrium are, I'm going to pretend take a convenient mathematical fiction, because remember the species are interacting with each other dynamically, but as a convenient mathematical fiction, imagine what would happen to species one if we could hold species two constant. And so if species two is held constant at zero, we have our normal model, this dark green line that goes to carrying capacity at 500. Now, if species two, say, is we hold it constant at 100 individuals, um, we have this, sec this new growth curve that intersects at this other point that's reduced by the presence uh, of that 100 individuals. So, you know, 100 individuals of species two reduces the carrying capacity for species one by about 75. Um, so this is an, an indication of an asymmetric competition. You know, it, it's not reduced, 100 individuals in species two does not reduce the carrying capacity by 100, but it does reduce the carrying capacity. Uh, and interestingly, it also reduces the overall growth rate at every value of n because it's now competing with another species. And so now when this is positive, the species is increasing. Uh, and when relative to this second green line, when growth rate is negative, it's decreasing. And so we have this new stable equilibrium at a lower value, a, lower, a value that's lower than k. So remember, k is not changed. k is still 500. But the equilibrium is lower because there's now 100 of, the, of species 1 using up resources. And we could do this for a whole bunch of different levels. So uh, I could have 100, I have no competitors, 100 competitors, 200, 300, 400, so on. And each time we've reduced the growth curve and we reduce uh, the equilibrium point below the carrying capacity. And I would say what we can do now is, is kind of see, visualize this. So what we, we don't necessarily want to see a million growth curves to understand what's actually going on. You know, so what we said, saw is that as we varied species two, we varied the equilibrium. And so what I'm going to do here is plot um, 
as we here, we're going to vary species two and plot where the equilibrium ended up. So remember, uh, when there's zero species two, you increase, 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 increase until uh, you reach equilibrium at carrying capacity. And so what we're doing here is kind of looking at this graphical analysis, but without the curve itself. So when we were at N2 was at 100, we increased up into that point about 425, where we reached our new steady state. And when we were above that, we decreased. And we can see this for every value. We can see that when we're below this curve, we're increasing because the growth rate is positive. And when we're above this curve, this line, um, the growth rate is negative and we're decreasing. And so this line defines all the possible equilibriums. So these, these are all possible equilibriums and which equilibrium you end at depends on what N2 is doing. And so we don't know what N2 is doing. N2 is doing something dynamic in response to species one, but we know that the equilibrium is gonna end up on this line. And so if we could do the same thing for species two, figure out what its equilibriums are, we could figure out where the overall equilibrium of the system is. Um, you know, where, where are they both at equilibrium? Cool. Uh, lots of lines. So what we drew there are sometimes called null clines or they're sometimes called zero growth isoclines because they represent the line that defines the possible equilibrium, the possible point where there's zero growth. And so this red line here and these arrows kind of graphically represent what we were just looking at for species one. This intercept here is at the carrying capacity, K1, and this intercept over here depends on the value of uh, the competitive coefficient. So where it ends up over here uh, depends on what alpha is set to. So alpha kind of determines that point there. And you're going to see that that's going to actually have an, the value of alpha is going to have a pretty large impact on uh, what the outcomes are, which is not surprising because how strong competition is, is going to impact how the outcomes are. So if we drew this plot this way for the interactions between how, how species two affects species one, we can also draw the zero growth isocline for species, uh, the effect of species one on species two. So now from the perspective of species two, it starts out of it, at its carrying capacity. And anytime it is below its carrying capacity and N1 is at zero, it's going to increase. Anytime it's at N1 is at zero and it's above its carrying capacity, it's gonna decrease. And then likewise, if we fix N2 at some small value, we get a new equilibrium. If we increase N1 to another value, we get a new equilibrium of N2. If we increase N1 again, we get a new equilibrium of N2. If we increase N1 again, we get a new equilibrium of N2 and so on and so forth. And so we draw this black line, which describes all possible equilibriums for species two, where it intersects the y-axis at K2, its carrying capacity, and then its x-intercept is determined by its competitive coefficient. And so when we're looking at N2 on the y-axis, we're always drawing these arrows vertically where we're decreasing if we're above the line and increasing if we're below the line. And for species one on the x-axis, um, we're always drawing them when you're below the line over here and above the line over there. Cool. So I wanna go through those possible outcomes we talked about before and look at how, um, how the, the relative effects of where A alpha one, two and alpha two, one are, how those affect the overall outcomes. So here's a case um, where the lines do not cross and this, the growth curve for species one in red is above the growth curve for species two in black. So if we focus on the red curve, I'm gonna draw in a bunch of extra arrows. If I'm above that curve, I'm declining. 
And from species one perspective, remember that those arrows are parallel to the x-axis. And if I'm above that curve, I'm above my carrying capacity and I'm declining. If I'm below that curve, I'm increasing. So in this space below the red curve, a species one is increasing. In this space below both curves, species one is increasing because it's below the red curve. Uh, if I add a bunch of arrows for the species two, so up here, uh, when I'm above both curves, I'm above the black curve, and so I'm declining. When I'm in between the two, I'm above the black curve, so I'm declining. And when I'm below below the black curve, I'm below my carrying capacity, so I'm increasing. And so if I have vectors uh, for the red and I have vectors for the black, uh, I can combine those two vectors to figure out where the overall trajectory of the system would be going. So if I'm up here, we're both species, in this case, both species are declining uh, because uh, species one is above its carrying capacity, species two is above its carrying capacity. So we know they're both declining. In contrast, down here in the lower triangle, both are below uh, their carrying capacity, so both are increasing. But in this space in between, uh, for all these values, for every place in between, uh, species one is below its isocline, below the red line, so it's increasing. Species two is above the black line, its isocline, so it's decreasing. And so in between, species two is declining, but species one is increasing. And so if you follow that out logically to figure out, you can figure out where the equilibrium is. Uh, it's going to be here at K1 because all arrows are pointing, you know, if you're done here, you're going to increase until you cross that line, then you're going to come back down. If you're over here, you're going to decrease to cross this line and come back down. And everything's going to lead you back down here. And if, you, if you're coming down and hit the x-axis, then species two just went extinct and species one is below its carrying capacity. So it's just going to go to its carrying capacity. And so species one goes to K1, species two goes to zero. Uh, and so any case, so we have non-overlapping uh, isoclines, the one that's higher wins. So let's see if that's true if we re reverse it. So we reverse it, non-overlapping uh, isoclines. Now the black species is higher than the red species. And if we put, draw on the lines for the red species, when we're up here, uh, you're above the red line, so you're declining. When you're in the middle, you're above the red line, so you're declining. And when you're in the bottom triangle, you're below the red line, so you're increasing. And then for the black species, when you're up here, you're above the black line, so you're declining. Uh, when you're in the middle, you're below the black line, so you're increasing. And when you're in the bottom triangle, you're below the black line, so you're increasing. So we have what we expected. Uh, in this case, you're always increasing. In this case, you're, both are declining in the middle section, which is where you're going to end up if you're in either of the others. Um, species two is increasing, but species one is declining, and you're going to end up back at K2. And so K2 is going to be a stable equilibrium. So the stable equilibrium is K2 wins, species one goes extinct. Um, you could see that K1 zero is actually an unstable equilibrium. So if species two is extinct, species one can go to its carrying capacity, but at any times you leave that equilibrium, it's an unstable equilibrium, because anytime you introduce species two, it'll drive species one extinct. So you've probably guessed by now um, that things are gonna be more interesting when the lines cross, because obviously if whichever line is higher wins, is a pretty easy outcome to predict. So here we've set up a case where the lines are crossing. And so let's go through the, this and focus first on species one. So when we're in the bottom uh, quadrat, species one is below its carrying capacity, so it increases. When we're in this upper triangle, species one is below its equilibrium, so it's increases. As always, when we're up in the top quadrat, you're above your carrying capacity, so you're decreasing. And then in this bottom triangle, 
this bottom uh, kind of bottom center triangle. Uh, species one is above its equilibrium, so it's decreasing. And then we add species two. Um, when you're in the bottom quadrat, uh, your species two is below its line, so it's increasing. When we're in this upper triangle, it's above its line, so it's decreasing. As always, up here in the upper area, it's declining. And then in this bottom triangle, uh, it's below its equilibrium line, so it's increasing. And so when we draw out those possibilities, um, you end up with any anytime you're in the bottom, you move up and you're going to cross into one of the two triangles. Anytime you're at the top, you're going to come down and enter into one of the two triangles. And once you're in the triangles, all arrows move inward to that uh, point in the center. And so that point where they cross uh, represents an, an equilibrium point. They both can exist there. Um, and furthermore, not only is it an equilibrium point where both of them have zero growth, but it's a stable equilibrium because all arrows point inward towards that point. And that stable equilibrium is occurring when K1 over alpha 1, 2 is bigger than K2, and where K2 over alpha 2, 1 is bigger than K1. Um, and one way of kind of interpreting that, it ends up being that, that this point is a stable equilibrium. Uh, when you view competitive interactions with your own species as being stronger, uh, than competitive interactions with your own species. Now, here's this last case. Uh, again, they're they're crossing, but now we've switched the order. Uh, K2 is above K1 over alpha 1, 2. K1 is above K2 over alpha 2, 1. If we draw on the lines, uh, so for species 1, 2, as always, you're declining in the bottom, you're increasing in the uh, you're declining the top, increasing when you're the bottom quadrat. When you're in this upper triangle, you're above your equilibrium, so you're declining. And when you're in this bottom triangle, you're below your equilibrium, so you're increasing. We add the black lines. Uh, in the top, you're, you're both declining. In the bottom, you're both increasing. In this upper triangle, bl the black one is below its equilibrium line, so it's increasing. In this bottom triangle, uh, species two is above its equilibrium line, so it's declining. This point of intersection is still an equilibrium because it's a point where both of them have zero growth, but it is now an unstable equilibrium. And it's an unstable equilibrium because if you're perturbed away from it a little bit, uh, you if you're in, perturbed away from it into the upper triangle, you're moving away from it towards K2, and if you were perturbed away th from it towards the lower triangle, you're declining towards K1. So this is a case where K1 and K2 are both stable equilibrium. Uh, but in one case, when you're at K1, species two goes extinct. If you're at K2, species one goes extinct. And so the outcome of the competitive interactions depends upon the initial conditions. So the species, even though there's an equal equilibrium point for both of them that's not a stable one, so they don't actually coexist. So some take-homes. Uh, we used graphical analyses to find not only where the equilibrium points were in a two-species system, uh, but also to figure out the stability of those equilibrium. Um, the results are really the same as what we did in the stability lecture, uh, but with much much less math. We've kind of just extended the graphical analyses we did in the stability lecture. Um, and we, like we saw in the stability lecture, that there's some generality here to the outcomes of interactions uh, that go beyond the specific functional forms used. I'll also point out that uh, one of the challenges of the Lotka Volterra model for competition is that if I want to get three species to interact, I now move to, instead of a plane with two species, uh, I move to a kind of a three-dimensional volume 
with three isoclines that are planes. Um, so if any of two of them interact, those represent a potential equal a whole line of equilibriums between those two. To get three species to stably coexist means that those three planes have to over intersect at the exact same point. And that, that criteria for that is, is much harder. Um, and in general, the criteria to get N species to coexist uh, in a logical Volterra type competitive model is very, very hard uh, and very, very unrealistic for a lot of species to reach equilibrium, uh, assuming the logical Volterra model, um, which leads to, you know, was actually one of the big motivation motivators for me when I got into ecology uh, that in addition to, you know, all the practical uh, aspects of, of why ecology was useful for conservation uh, was this really interesting uh, kind of theoretical point, which is that biodiversity clearly happens in the real world, uh, but it should not happen in theory. So basic ecological theory, uh, as written down by the logical Volterra model, makes something that we see every day uh, very hard to prove and very hard to explain. Um, and so it's like when we look at the exponential growth model, you know, the simplest thing we wrote down does not do a good job of explaining uh, what's going on in the real world. So same with the logical Volterra model. It's the simplest way of representing competitive interactions, but it doesn't really represent, doesn't really capture um, what's going on in interactions between species. And I would say that there's been uh, many decades, about a century of research now trying to explain why, and I would say that we, we haven't fully reached a satisfactory explanation for why so many species uh, can coexist uh, in many systems around the world um, without coming up with criteria that are unrealistic. Um, so it's, it's a very interesting problem. Uh, we can also see that, that you know, really the, if you come back to graphs like this, um, that what's going on in between all these places you know, the shapes of those functional forms don't really mat don't matter nearly as much as the equilibriums. And likewise, it doesn't really matter whether these lines are straight or not. So if you have uh, models that relax the assumptions a good bit, um, it doesn't actually change the fundamental properties here, which is there's going to be some uh, isocline that draws a shape that describes the equilibrium for each of these two species. And they're only going to you know, the, the stable point of uh, either stable or unstable coexistence only occurs at the points of intersection. So making the equations more flexible does not necessarily change um, the fundamental understanding of coexistence. Um, it's also worth, worth noting that we can extend uh, this not to just com competitive interactions between species, but also uh, trophic interaction. So here would be a, an example of isoclines drew, uh, that we draw for the interactions between uh, a predator, a prey species and a predator species. So what we have here is that when the predator is extinct, the prey is at its carrying capacity. As we increase the predator, the amount of prey, the equilibrium for the prey goes down. That makes perfect sense. It's very similar to what we saw for logical Volterra. When we look at the predator, on the other hand, if the prey is extinct, uh, the predator is extinct. <laughs> and, and we see that the, instead of this line being sloped backwards, we see the opposite. As, as we increase the prey, we increase uh, the, the number of predators that can exist in the system. And so you could do the similar sort of uh, stability analysis here to analyze um, how does species how does the prey species affect the predator? How does the predator affect the prey? And is this point where they interact a stable equilibrium or not? Uh, you know, where is this? What is this system going to do? And I'll leave that as an exercise. Thanks.